how could we have ever predicted 2020 and 2021? The massive impact that COVID, the pandemic, global pandemic has had on our lives, economically, socially, relationally, structurally, and besides all the practical, tangible areas of our lives, we've seen the impact on things that we perhaps not always be able to see with our natural eye. The impact on our thought lives, our emotions, the, the very psyche and well-being of us as human beings. You know, here in the United Kingdom, it's been interesting to read some of the newspaper articles um, as far as the the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic on people's lives has been concerned. Mental health hotlines in the first three months of the pandemic saw a rise of over 200%. We've seen the impact on marriages. There's been more marriage breakdown during COVID than pre-COVID. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know this, um, but on the first Monday of each year, the first working Monday of every calendar year, Um, It's actually called Divorce Monday. More divorces are filed on that Monday globally than on any other day during the course of the year. Now, in the United Kingdom, Google reported that in December 2019 to the period of December 2020, Uh, More people, as a matter of fact, 566% more searches on the little phrase filing for divorce took place on Google. Uh, Quickie Divorce had 235% more searches and divorce lawyer near me saw a rise by 233%. You see, we have to recognize, and and, and this is part of what I want to do today, We have to recognize that the struggle we sometimes have in our mind, our mental health, depression is real. Again, just another statistic because it would be too complicated to try and do this in all the different spaces that that Church reaches. But in the United Kingdom, between March 2020 and March 2021, 803,000 more antidepressant prescriptions were issued based on historical trends, that's a rise of 23%. And the highest proportion of the people that accessed this were under the age of 25. Depression and struggling with our mental health has become the number one health problem in the world. And we have to recognize that sometimes there are biological reasons for our mental health. You know, an imbalance in our body sometimes contributes to depression or anxiety. But here's the thing. If we allow biology to become the whole picture, I think we miss some of the real solutions. Because depression is not a malfunction of the mind. Depression and struggling with your mental health is actually a signal your body, your, your psyche, your, your, your well-being is trying to tell you something. It's like driving in the car and, 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 the, and the light goes on that says you're running low on fuel. You know, th- that light is actually just a signal. It's trying to tell you something about what's happening on the inside. I think the other thing that's sometimes difficult when we talk about mental health and depression, there's often a stigma that comes with that. You know, if, if you have a, a, a cold or you've broken your arm, there's, there's no stigma attached to that. But we've got to remove the stigma that is attached to depression or other mental health issues. The problem is, for us as Christians, is that when this illness or this moment becomes our identity and we start, you know, building our lives on this identity, that's when the Bible says, listen, hang on a moment. This is moving into an area that Christ does not desire for us. And so this series, Out of the Cave, over the next two weeks, that is exactly what I'm going to try and address. I want to see what does the Bible say about these issues. So let's start, start off by just making something very clear. You know, God wants us to live free. God wants you to live free, happy and with meaning. Freedom is actually why Jesus came. And and so at the onset of this message, I want to read you Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 that says, At last we have freedom for Christ has set us free. We must always cherish this truth. (laughs) I love that. We must always 
cherish this truth. Why does he say we must always? It sounds like a South African. South Africans say you must do this and you must do that. Okay, but, but the reality is the Apostle Paul comes, he says, you must always cherish this because it's possible for us not to. It's possible for us to lose sight of the freedom that we have in Christ. And he says, we must always cherish this truth and firmly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. You see, a lot of great people, even in the Bible, struggled with their emotions and their mental health. The prophet Jeremiah wrote a whole book on the, in, in the Bible on his depression. It's called Lamentations. Okay, no wonder. In chapter 3, verse 17, he says these words, I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. Perhaps somebody listening to this message is saying that's exactly how I feel today. And now he goes on, he says, So I say, my splendor is gone, and all that I'd hoped for from the Lord. I remember my affliction and wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Jeremiah wrote about this. The apostle Paul wrote about this in 2 Corinthians, where he says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Paul struggled. But there was, you know, if you think about Jesus, how he struggled, how he struggled in the garden the, the night before he was crucified, just calling his friends alongside, just saying, just come and sit with me. Another great man in the Bible was a prophet, Elijah. And I, I actually want to go to 1 Kings chapter 8 in the next few minutes. This prophet had just experienced a major victory. Israel had turned its back on God. Uh, the king, Ahab, had married a woman called Jezebel and she had brought Baal and the prophets of Baal and the, and, and the statues and the idols all across the nation and people had forgotten about who God is. And so here is Elijah and, he, and he's in a standoff against the priests of Baal. And the priests of Baal, 450 of them, build this massive altar and they sacrifice on it. And, and Elijah comes and he builds a simple altar. And, and, and for hours and hours and hours on end, um, Ahab and Jezebel's priests of, of Baal actually cut themselves and they're lamenting and crying and, and nothing happens. And Elijah stands up and in one moment, in a prayer, Fire from heaven consumes this altar and God is declared king. The priests of Baal are, are, are killed and, and, and a massive change takes place in Israel. <laughs> massive victory for Elijah. But in this moment, he discovers that Jezebel is angry with him and she's trying to kill him and he, he flees, he, he, he runs away. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, we read these verses where it says, Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. And, and when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And he came to a broom bush and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. <laughs> Have you prayed that before? And then he says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. You see, here's Elijah, fearless for three years. And one incident, one threat, he turns out and runs into the edge of the desert and becomes depressed. And so what I want to do for the next few minutes, I, I want to I just unpack a few things of how we end up in the cave. Uh, and these might be like little light bulbs or little moments that you can just measure and say, you know, am I allowing these things into my life? Because most of the reasons that we, that we struggle with this is because of our lifestyles. We're doing it to ourselves. You know, and, and whilst we have to recognize that actually, you know, this is a disease of lifestyle more than anything else. No amount of medication or counseling or scripture or sermons can do it alone. We have to partner together in this. And so what I want to do is I want to show you six different ways. And we're going to see this in the life of Elijah. Six different things about how we sometimes allow our lives to come into a place of risk. And the enemy actually gets a chance to take our freedom away. The first one is life imbalances. 
You see, sometimes we, we need to talk about chemical imbalances in our body. But sometimes it's more important to talk about the imbalances in the way we live. You know, Elijah's depression came right after two major spiritual victories. This reminds us that we're not at our best when we're tired. And we become vulnerable when we're tired. And more and more research is pointing to our lifestyles as the leading cause. You know, research has recently shown that depression is more prevalent in the type of lifestyle that has become normal in our society. Stephen Elardi, author of The Depression Cure, wrote these words. He said, we were never designed for the sedentary, indoor, socially isolated, fast food laden, sleep deprived, frenzied pace of modern life. So, what do we need to do? We need to order our lives and give attention to the pace. You know, just over the last week, I've been considering as a dad, how many, you know, we, how many times we come to a Sunday night and, you know, it's, it's, it's busy in our household. We've, you know, we've got three boys who are still at school and, and Sunday nights is normally, you know, have you done your homework and why is this not done? And, you know, get your cricket clothes ready for tomorrow and the rugby and remember it's a music lesson and, and your shoes. What, what, what do you mean your shoes? You, you left your shoes at your friend's house on Thursday already. What did you go to with school? You know, what did you do on Friday? There's this moment of absolute chaos. And, and we sit down in, on the couch and we're like, oh, tomorrow another week starts. But it's how we perceive it. Because actually our week doesn't start on a Monday. Our week starts on a Sunday. When we come together, when we sit around the word, when we take a moment, when we breathe in the life of God and we breathe out the praises of our God and we allow our lives to be, you know, the first, um, if you want to talk about first, there's a big concept for you, but we allow the first of our lives to define the holiness of the rest. We do that with our finances. We give first and then we trust God for his abundance and his blessing. We should learn to do that with our time. We give that first. That's why we gather, albeit online, albeit in, in hot spots, wherever you are. That is how we start our week. Listen to what Ecclesiastes says. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. The second thing that I think sometimes becomes a check to our lives is when we start comparing ourselves with others. You know, Elijah has this moment when he says, I'm no better than my ancestors. Actually, he was comparing himself to them and that made him more depressed. Theodore Roosevelt said, comparison is the thief of joy. <laughs> you just need to have four boys around your table to know that because they're always comparing you know who got the biggest slice of cake you know who how did this work how did this tree and the minute that that happens joy goes out the front door because I think this is one of the biggest issues of our day we live in this narcissistic society with a lack of true identity and that's why we sometimes peer-to-peer -peer mentor, you know, we talk to our friends instead of allowing elders to mentor our younger people Actually, it says that, you know, when we don't allow ourselves when we, uh, to live this free life in Christ and we start comparing ourselves, they reckon that it amplifies mental triggers a hundred times more. It's a recipe for a complete mental health meltdown. You see, the biblical model of health teaches us that the, the older people should be teaching the younger people. And, the, and, 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 and this is the transformation of generations. The problem is, if we don't model this to each other, it will go lost in our generation. You know, recently, some social media platform contributors and creators, if you think about the lady in Facebook in the USA that recently came out and said, listen, I worked with Facebook. I did some of these things. This is what is bringing damage to people's lives. They're renouncing what they've done because of what it's done to the human mind and to the psychology of people's hearts. We compare ourselves. You know, I look at my Instagram feed and I think, oh, well, you know, here's somebody else and their Instagram feed looks much better. Look where they are. They're next to the beach or they're doing this or they're doing that. Or look at this wonderful meal. 
and it impacts on our psyche, it impacts on how we feel about ourselves. And if our identity in Christ is not secure, we will struggle. Listen to what Galatians 6 says. It says, each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. We've got to stop comparing ourselves with others because we all have different assignments. Here's the third check that I think is important. When we start ruminating and self-talking, <laughs> you, know, you know what happens to a cow? You know, a cow eats and then it, 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 it swallows and then it ruminates. It brings it up. It chews the cud. And that's what we sometimes do in our own life. You know, we think we've dealt with something and then we just bring it up again. And all that we're doing is we're just chewing over it again. And, and this self-talk creates a negative, toxic environment that impacts our mental health. Because it's focused on the, on the symptoms of your distress as opposed to be focused on the solutions. And we start overthinking and obsessing about situations or life events, you know, such as work or, or relationships. And, and this self-talk, it's in this moment that the devil loves to show up there. It's ex exactly what happened to Elijah. He got alone in his thoughts. And the story got worse for him. You know, you know I'm the one left behind and I'm not as good as what they are. And the fact is he was believing a lie. One of the writers in this area, Brian Tracy, writes, 95% of your emotions are determined by the way you talk to yourself. Now, just listen to what Philippians 4 verse 8, the Apostle Paul, listen to what the Bible, this is our departure point. It says, keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising Him always. Put into practice the example of all that you've heard from me and seen in my life, and the God of peace will be with you in all things. You see, when we control our thinking, something happens in our lives. The best solution that you can sometimes do in a moment like this is, is process with somebody else. Call somebody. Share your frustrations. Do not allow yourself to bring up the past. And all that you're doing is you're ruminating and self-talking into this situation that brought you here. Don't allow that. Here's the fourth element. The inability to process pain in a healthy way. You know, sometimes life is tough. We, we all handle life differently. We all feel pain and then we do something to, to address that pain. We call it medication. <laughs> Some people medicate in an unhealthy way. You know? Some use actual physical medication. So others drink or binge eat or it becomes a way to cope with life. They watch television, you know, Netflix, episode 334, or video games, or you work more, or you work harder. But ultimately, it's about one thing. It's about trying to drown out this pain. Now, just listen to this. The Jewish psychiatrist from Austria named Viktor Frankl, he was part of the Holocaust, and he believed that Sigmund Freud's theory about humanity was wrong. Because Sigmund Freud believed that humanity made life all about pleasure. That is what would give us this sense of fulfillment is pleasure. But Viktor Frankl said that Sigmund Freud was wrong. He felt that life was not about pleasure. It was about meaning. And when you don't have any meaning, you dull yourself with, uh, with pleasure. So after World War II... Viktor Frankl worked with suicidal patients in Vienna, ones who had been in the concentration camps, and he gave them three things. He called it logotherapy. Now, just to say, for, for this Greek, you know, when you use a word like logos therapy, I'm, you've got my attention. Logos, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and okay, you get it. All right, all right. But listen to what he did in his logotherapy. He gave people meaningful work, something to do that matters. He gave people a community of friends who loved them unconditionally. And he, he taught them to take whatever suffering they were experiencing and find the positive in that. 
Do you know that in Viktor Frankl's uh, uh, watch, <laughs> not one of his patients committed suicide? So how then should we deal with this? How do we deal with this? How do we deal with it when we're struggling? In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 to 6, the Bible again comes to give us this wisdom. It says, God always comes alongside us to comfort us in every suffering so that we can come alongside those who are in any painful trial. We can bring them the same comfort that God has poured out on us. And just as we experience the abundance of Christ's own sufferings, even more of God's comfort will cascade upon us through our union with Christ. If trouble weighs us down, that just means that we will receive even more comfort to pass on to you for your deliverance. For the comfort pouring into us empowers us to bring comfort to you. You see, the Bible teaches us that there is purpose in our pain. Remember, <laughs> this is not the comprehensive conversation on this. I, I cannot address this in six points and one 25-minute sermon. You have to discover that what God is doing in you is important, but more importantly, what is God doing through you? Here's the fifth element, isolation and loneliness. D did you pick that up when we read about Elijah? He got to the edge of the desert and then what did he do? He left his servant there. That's what so many of us do. And let me tell you, it's a trap. Because the first problem in the Bible wasn't sin. The first problem that we read about in the Bible was solitude. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, we, we read these words. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. And so often in our pain, you know, have you ever had toothache? When, when you have toothache, you don't want to think about anything or anybody else. It's just you focusing. And what happens is when we're struggling in our emotions, when we're captivated by a sense of, of brokenness and pain, what happens to us is we tend to isolate ourselves. And that puts us even more at risk than what it was if we were in community. That's what happened to Elijah. In Romans chapter 12 verse 5, the Apostle Paul says, Since we are all one body in Christ, we belong to each other and and each of us needs all the others. Let me tell you, we need each other. You might be listening to this message and thinking, you know, here I am on my own. I might be watching on my device or whatever. The, the reality is God has actually placed the church right next to you for you to engage and connect so that you can be supported, covered, prayed for in relationship. Find a space to make a contribution it moves you out of that space of loneliness and brokenness. Listen, you need me as much as I need you. Here's the sixth one and the last one. I want to land with this. And this is the one that I think we sometimes forget. It's the lies of a defeated enemy. We forget this one sometimes because we end up in the space where we, we recognize we're human beings looking for temporary spiritual experiences. But our reality is actually that we're spiritual beings having human experiences. And you are a spirit being. And that's why they, there's an enemy that would want to distract you from every revelation of your true identity in Christ. He would rather you identify yourself in the brokenness and the solitude of Adam than identify yourself in the completeness of the true and final identity in the Son, Jesus Christ. Let me tell you again, I've said it before, it is finished. It is done. And your victory doesn't lie in winning some kind of a spiritual war. You know, this isn't you having to take out a sword and chop the devil's ear off or something. Your victory lies in the discovery of who you truly are. Because in that way, we actually enforce that which Christ has already accomplished on our behalf. But listen to the words of 1 Peter 5 verse 8 to 9 where he says, Listen, be self-controlled and alert. For your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Come on. <laughs> Come on, church. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. 
You know, he's working harder to destroy you than you to keep it hap- from happening. I-, I think we've become so accustomed to it as a fact of life that we sometimes just shrug it off and carry on business as usual. And if, I, if I told you that the devil was coming to your house tonight, what would you do? You know, it will be a little bit like home alone. You know, you'd watch the movie and catch a few tips and see how you can catch him out. But our reality is, you know, the scripture commands us, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. I love that word stand because that's what our identity does. It allows us to stand against the enemy's schemes. You know, the bottom line of this entire message is is that God has given you the authority. But you have to use it. Can I, can I just sum this up again by just, just mentioning these six, six things? Life imbalances, comparing yourself to others, ruminating, self-talk, our inability to process pain in a healthy way, isolation and loneliness, and then lastly, the lies of a defeated enemy. I so wish that I could just pray for you and, you know, bang. I recognize today's word is seed in your hand. And for some of you, we're going to, it is so. Prayer does change absolutely everything. For all of us, it does. But but some of you might be captive in this so deeply that you that you might want to put your hand up and say, actually, I need to speak to somebody. I need to speak to a counselor. Can I encourage you to do that or contact us and and speak to us? We can maybe point you in the direction of somebody. But the reality is there is victory in Christ. He wants you to live free. And so, Father, in this moment, I want to pray for each and every person watching this message. Lord, it's such a bulky message. We know a lot of information, but I want to pray that something would captivate their spirit. Something would sit in their mind, recognizing, desiring the freedom that we know there is in Christ. And so I speak over each and every man and woman, freedom in Jesus' name. May you in this moment experience a work of God in your life. May you you tangibly experience the Holy Spirit working in your mind. May you be guided. May the word be your strength and your firm foundation. May you find yourself connecting and reconnecting in ways that would move you out of a place of solitude and brokenness, captive in your thoughts into a place of freedom in Christ. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this family. Thank you for our community and our engagement. Thank you that this will be a place of wholeness, of healing, of recovery and breakthrough. In Jesus' name. Amen and Amen.